As I waited in the drowsy, neon-lit customs line at JFK, I tried to remember precisely when the war on drugs started. In some vague way, I had a sense that it must have been with Richard Nixon in the 1970s, when the phrase was first widely used. Or was it with Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, when Just Say No seemed to become the second national anthem? But when I started to travel around New York City, interviewing experts on drug policy, I began to get a sense that this whole story had, in fact, begun long before. The pledge to wage relentless warfare on drugs was, I found, first made in the 1930s, by a man who has been largely forgotten today. Yet he did more than any other individual to create the drug world we now live in. I learned there are vast forgotten piles of this man's paperwork at Penn State University, his diary, his letters, all his files. So I headed there on a Greyhound bus and began to read through everything I could find by and about Harry Anslinger. Only then did I begin to see who he really was and what he means for us all. In those files, I learned that at the birth of the war on drugs, there were three people who could be seen as its founding figures. If there was a Mount Rushmore for drug prohibition, it is their faces who would be carved into its mountainside, staring impassively back, slowly eroding. I chased the information about them across many more archives, and to the last remaining people who remember them. Now, three years later, after all I have learned, I find myself picturing these founding figures as they were when the drug war clouds first began to gather. As kids, scattered across the United States, not knowing what was about to hit them or what they would achieve. That is where, it seems to me, this story begins. In 1904, a twelve-year-old boy was visiting his neighbor's farmhouse in the cornfields of western Pennsylvania when he heard a scream. It was coming from somewhere above him. This sound, desperate, aching, made him confused. What was going on? Why would a grown woman howl like an animal? Her husband ran down the stairs and gave the boy a set of hurried instructions. Take my horse and cart into the town as fast as you can. Pick up a package from the pharmacy. Bring it here. Do it now. The boy lashed at the horses because he was certain that if he failed, he would return to find a corpse. As soon as he flopped through the door and handed over the bag of drugs, the farmer ran to his wife. Her screaming stopped, and she was calm. But the boy would not be calm about this. Not ever again. I never forgot those screams, he wrote years later. From that moment on, he was convinced there was a group of people walking among us who may look and sound normal, but who could at any moment become emotionally hysterical, degenerate, mentally deficient, and vicious, if they were allowed contact with the great unhinging agent, drugs. When he grew into a man, this boy was going to draw together some of the deepest fears in American culture— of racial minorities, of intoxication, of losing control, and channel them into a global war to prevent those screams. It would cause many screams in turn. They can be heard in almost every city on earth tonight. This is how Harry Anslinger entered the drug war. On a different afternoon, a few years earlier, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a wealthy Orthodox Jewish trader walked in on a scene that he could not understand. His three-year-old son was standing over his sleeping brother, holding a knife, ready to stab him. "'Why, my son, why?' the trader asked. The little boy said that he hated his brother.'